what I'd like to spend some time today is actually talk about a risk analysis methodology that we've done on the ammonia situation here in Israel and give you some thoughts and perspectives on what, what may be possible or what may not be possible. So before I really go into the actual calculations, go into um, some of the results that we have, I want to give a little bit of an over overview on, first of all, what is risk? Um, as I was talking to a couple of people at the break, I realized that risk means different things to different people. Um, it's one of those dirty four-letter words. So I want to explain a little bit where we're coming from on risk, uh, because w the background that I have is a little bit different than a lot of other people, and then how we're applying that definition. Uh, first of all, risk is a combination of things. It's the likelihood of a specific event, a specific effect within a specific period of time with a specific event. Um, it is a function of multiple things. The way that we tend to look at it is it's a function of consequence, vulnerability, and threat. Uh, it's also a lot of people combine the vulnerability and the threat piece into probability or frequency. That's actually how we'll be looking at it today as risk is a function of frequency and consequence. Risk is not consequences alone. So that 10 people, that 20 people, that 30 people could die, that's a consequence, that's not the risk. You have to factor in how likely that event is going to happen. You have to factor in the probability of that event. Uh, also, some organizations um, consider risk only as a factor of toxicity. It's a really toxic material, so it must have a high risk. That, again, is not the case. Uh, toxicity is certainly a factor in determining consequences and a factor of determining risk, but toxicity alone is not risk. So hazard, which also has been confused with being risk, is the property or properties that make a chemical or a situation uh, have a potential for causing damage. So don't, again, don't confuse hazard with risk. Determining risk is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, again, I have to stress, it's not just about consequences. Um, high consequences, I tend, will disagree with Kent a little bit. Uh, high consequences with a zero frequency does generate no risk. You can't, nothing bad happens. Um, just like high, freak, um, high consequences with low uh, frequency, doesn't cause any risk. Again, because you can't, something doesn't happen. Um, the, you can use risk to quantify the hazards. Uh, you can use risk then to quantify mitigation steps. And so it's essential, it's essential to use risk to develop the applicable mitigation steps that can be taken. So there are a number of ways to compute risk. Um, I'll talk about three right here. Kent showed a slide with one method, the risk management table. Um, that is a very valuable way of looking at risk. Um, it is a qualitative method. I'm actually in the middle block at the moment. Um, it's qualitative only. It does require a good definition of the scales that you're using. And you can use multi-criteria decision analysis to help you define that. Multi-criteria decision analysis, MDCDA, and I'm going really quickly on these because I want to spend time on the results, uh, is a way of, that's used a lot. In fact, you'll find MCD or MCDA used more than most any other technique. Um, it, it really helps in dividing your, your decision down into smaller bite-sized pieces and then analyzing each piece, and then you can integrate those pieces into a meaningful solution. Uh, it generally requires consensus building and agreement among multiple parties, um, and although metrics are re required, MCD is a qualitative tool. 
it's, it's, it can't be used to define real absolute numbers, not normally. Um, the method that, that we tend to use, and although we have used both MCD and risk management tables a lot in the past, um, the, the one that we're actually going to be using today, describing today, is QRA, quantitative risk analysis. Um, and that does specifically consider risk as a function of frequency or probability and consequences. Um, it requires lots of numbers. It's very, very data intensive. Uh, and it is very time intensive. So those are, tend to be reasons why QRA is not applied a lot. Um, it can incorporate distributions, which makes it powerful, which means you can look at uncertainties. Um, I'm not going to be doing that today uh, for reasons that I'll describe later. Um, and there are many examples of MCD, use of risk management tables, and QRA in the literature, and I just identified three on the bottom of this slide. So we're going to be applying QRA today. QRA, just as a quick aside, QRA is being used more and more in industry all of the time to look at safety. Uh, they're moving more and more away from risk management tables, moving more and more away from MCD approaches. Okay, so a uh, risk analysis roadmap, uh, there are many of them out there. This is just a simplified version that um, just I'd like to briefly go through. Uh, there are a couple of important steps. You have to define what system you're looking at, and you have to stay within that system definition. If you vary outside of that system, uh, that, that you are considering, then you have to really start all over again. And sometimes that does happen, actually. Um, you have to define the hazard for that system that you're going to be looking at, those hazard or hazards. From that hazard, you define the scenarios that are practical or, or that are realistic or that, that are worth considering. From that, you can define both the consequences and the frequencies associated with that scenario or those scenarios. From that, you get your risk, you estimate your risk. That's a stopping point for a lot of people, but I would argue that, that the natural extension of that, and really the value of it, is to take the next step. What can you do about it? How can you, how can you mitigate that risk? Is it sufficient? If it isn't, you start the whole process over again. If it is, Stop, you've done, you give a nice set of recommendations, and I get paid. So, uh, so let's now break out the methodology that we're going to be using today, our, um, talk a little bit about the consequence analysis that, that we did. Um, we used SkiPuff as our primary um, uh, consequence analysis, atmospheric transport dispersion model. Um, we used either a spreading circular pool for our low temperature, low pressure releases, or a two-phase jet for the high temperature, high pressure releases uh, for the initial release. All the other parameters for, uh, we varied to get a nice um, uh, range of, of uh, different conditions. Uh, we had a, a number of assumptions that we're using in this, and these assumptions, um, Professor Steve Hanna is going to talk at some length about a couple of these in a couple of uh, pres uh, two, two uh, presentations from now, or three. Um, we used a U.S. Coast Guard A.D. Little report, 1974 report, on, on the salvation, uh, describing the salvation of liquid ammonia in water. We're using their reduction assumptions. Uh, we're, of course, Ammonia is very positively buoyant. We're making those assumptions. Ski Puff takes those into account. And uh, we did look at, Steve spent a fair amount of time looking at hydration effects. Uh, and um, it has no to a limited effect. And so we're not considering those in our calculations. Uh, we, the way we generate the consequences, we generate a plume from Ski Puff. But that alone doesn't give you consequences. You have to overlay it on a population grid. Uh, m most of us that, are, that use Ski Puff will use land scan as uh, developing our population grid. For the, for the ammonia plumes, they're not long enough, they're not far enough to be able to use land scan. 
Landstand doesn't give that level of revolution, uh, resolution. Alex Cohen uh, from Hazmat Limited here in Haifa developed a uh, population grid, uh, 125 meter population uh, resolution population grid. And we overlay the plumes on top of that to generate our consequences. Uh, we use um, dosage to uh, contours to estimate the fatalities. That's the lethal concentration times time, LCTs. Um, uh, we have uh, ways of computing that, uh, and then that gives us the fatalities. Uh, so that's how we generate the fatalities. Uh, just as a, as a brief aside, this slide shows two of those plumes. Uh, the top plume is a 2,500 ton ship release with a spreading pool. It is a, a low temperature cryogenic release out of, out of a, a shipboard tank. The bottom plume is a uh, simultaneous five ISO tank release. One thing, if you note some of the landmarks, the, one of the big things that you'll note is that the plumes, even though it's 2,500 tons versus 62 and a half tons, the plumes are about the same in terms of distance and pretty much in terms of shape. This is because of the difference between a two-phase jet, high pressure, high temperature release, and a low temperature, low pressure release. Um, this also reminds me of some of the concepts I learned from inherently safer technology, safer design, where you want to reduce the, the temperature, you want to have lower temperatures, moderate the conditions. Lower temperature, lower pressure will reduce your uh, plume, will reduce your effects. So one has to really look at a couple of things from this that again, I believe you'll hear more in a couple of speakers, is when you define a scenario, you have to define the source terms, you have to define what type of release you're going to have, because as you see here, you're gonna get vastly different plumes with different concentrations if you don't do that. So then we take the consequences, and now looking at the frequency, uh, frequency is a very difficult thing to quantify. Uh, what we're basically using, and, and in, in this particular case, it's, it's doubly or triply difficult because we're not looking at one single process. We have to compare a number of different processes. So we need to look at, and, and those processes involve different modes of transportation. And it's very, very difficult to find papers that use consistent methods for those different modes of transportation that you can then combine those frequencies. So there is one document that um, Ken alluded to, that's the um, um, Health and Safety Executive's uh, failure rate report uh, that actually has failure rates for all of the major pieces and operations that we're looking at in this, both in terms of the isotanks, the ship, tanker trucks, storage. So we're using those failure rates for our frequencies. This maintains consistency across all those modes. Um, it does not account for human error. It, um, although it does have history and statistics incorporated into the report, it does not consider distributions. So as much as I would like to show you uncertainty, I can't. Um, and that's one thing that we want to try to move forward to in the future is the looking at this concept of uncertainty. So then what we do now is take those two consequences and frequency together, uh, and we're going to use the basic equation that risk is basically a product of the frequency and the concentration of the consequence for a given operation, then sum that, those individual uh, risk components up to get the entire process risk. Now, that graphic on the right, we're gonna be considering only steps one and two. We're not gonna look at the risk communication or the mitigation of the risk today. All we're, all we're focusing on right now is trying to get to that risk step. Uh, 
And as I said, we're not including uncertainty, but the way that we've done the calculations, we could throw uncertainty in relatively easily. So I want to focus on two primary scenarios, although we're going to throw a couple of more at you um, as we go through the presentation. The two primary scenarios we're going to be looking at is the um, small vessel, 2,500-ton ship, unloading to a pipeline, running the pipeline at 25 tons per hour to a plant, then uh, using some of that ammonia at that plant, transporting the rest by tanker truck to another plant. The second scenario is bringing in isotanks and uh, delivering them either here at Haifa or at Estod and then transporting them to the individual plants. So that's the basic scenarios that we're going to focus. We're going to vary the number of isotanks. We're going to look at specifically the, the, um, the ship-based um, um, process as well. So those two, uh, those two particular scenarios are described in columns uh, two and three of this chart. This is just to show you how we can, how we break up the, the overall process, the overall scenario into separate operations. Now those operations are not specific. There's actually a lot that goes into each of those, but this is a way of trying to keep it somewhat simple, but at the same time get enough detail that you can actually make some, some um, conclusions, draw some conclusions. And those, the check marks are those operations that are pertinent to that particular scenario or process. So, what about the what? Oh, the check marks. Those check marks are just, I mean, the, 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 the small checks are just because I only had a small uh, box in order to put the check mark. So those check marks are just those particular operations that are relevant to that particular scenario. No, that means we're using that operation. That operation is being used in that scenario. So. Um, so now, we actually, in looking at all of the scenarios, we had some 90 separate operations. I can't show those on a chart and expect anybody to read them. So for, for the main ones that we're going to be focusing on, which are isotanks, um, these are the primary operations that we're looking at. And so this is how, basically, we calculate the failure rate from the HSE report. Uh, multiply it by how many operations that we're using for that particular failure rate, calculate the likelihood, uh, compute consequences from ski puff, multiply them together, and we get our risk score for that particular operation. And yes, I know you would love to spend some time on it, and if I had two hours or after my presentation, I'd be happy to have anybody uh, go through this. I have these in both hard copy, I know. That's the problem. Uh, so let's get into the results. So the results, um, we can, and, and this is the only slide that I'll show you the specific operations. We can take the, um, here's three scenarios. Uh, one which is the triad, the ship, pipeline, tanker truck, uh, and then two different uh, numbers of isotanks, 21 and 49. Uh, we can look at the risk for each of those operations sum them all up, and we get a total composite risk. Uh, the total composite risk then, um, I can't deal in absolute risk because a lot of people uh, get upset with that and it really, it's difficult to, to comprehend. So let's look at the second line, which is the relative risk. The relative risk basically shows that the, the isotanks are higher in risk than the triad. It's actually, if you sum the two isotank lines together, because th that represents a single process, you get about a 93 to 7%, 93% to 70% ratio. Um, 
So, so it looks like uh, uh, the triad is much less risky. In fact, I want to say a few more things about that in a bit. Uh, we can vary the isotanks, number of isotanks. Look at different isotanks, look at different isotank configurations. And you see, as, uh, as you would not be surprised, the higher number of isotanks that you have, you're going to have a higher risk. That, that just makes sense. But here it is quantified. Uh, so keeping the number of isotanks down to a reasonable amount is certainly worthwhile doing. Um, and these, by the way, were all road. Uh, the isotank came in and then transported by road. What if we looked at rail? We can look at rail as well. Um, actually, the way that the rail would have to be employed right now, it does vastly increase the risk for the same number of tanks traveling the same route uh, by road. The reason for this is that there is no railhead at the port, <clears throat> there's no railhead at the plant. So you have to transport by road from the port, the isotanks from the road to the, to the railhead, you have to do your loading and unloading operations again there, then transport on rail. Oh, by the way, when you're transporting on rail, you're transporting them all in one, in one train, so you've got them all together, so you have the, a greater chance of a catastrophic event. And then you have to unload at the railhead on the south side and then transport by rail, uh, by road. So you're vastly increasing the number of operations. By the way, that violates another principle of inherently safer technology, which is simplify the process. We're definitely not simplifying the process here. So we, we've looked at a couple of other ones. Um, that, um, that we've considered um, just directly moving the tanker truck from the dock, loading at the dock and moving it to the plants, um, doing a transfer into isotanks offshore, uh, and doing a transfer into a pipeline offshore. Uh, as you would expect, the offshore buoy is really the safest because it's do, while it's using the operations far away from any people. So that really does come out to be the safest in terms of risk. The triad is about the same in terms of relative risk. And as we see the isotanks, the two isotank scenarios, which are the one that says isocontainers, that's 64, by the way, and the ship-to-ship uh, -ship transfer, both have among the higher of the risk. So if we just quickly uh, look at the value, uh, the, the comparison of the tanker trucks and the ISO containers, um, the, the ISO containers, you need a lot more tanks to transport in the ISO containers than you do the trucks. The trucks hold twice as much as the ISO containers do. Um, and if you had the truck scenario, you'd be using the pipeline scenario, so you really need a quarter of the number of the, um, of the uh, uh, tanker trucks anyway. Um, the number of obturations would be many times, four times less for trucks. Um, the stability of the load, we didn't talk at all about how ISO tanks sit on a flat car versus tanker trucks with an actual design tank. Uh, the tanker trucks are more stable. They're less likely to, prone to roll. They're less likely uh, to rupture in accidents. Um, the tank pressures are different. Uh, ISO tanks tend to have higher pressure than the tanker trucks. Oh, by the way, if we also include the consideration of the, of the ship and the pipeline, those are low pressure events, uh, cryogenic low pressure events. So, so they're going to have even less pressure, even safer. So if you consider just the trucks, the trucks themselves are about three times less in risk than the isotanks. The whole scenario with the, with the triad is about 15 times uh, less risky than the isotank scenario. And I know I'm rushing through this because Danny's going to pull the shepherd's crook off in a minute. Um, we, we did consider over 15 different scenarios. Uh, the isotank scenarios have the higher risk as as um, is, is expected. The frequency component is increased for the, for the scenarios that have more operations. Uh, 
So as you increase the operations, you're increasing your frequency rate for failure. Uh, more operations do, intend, do tend to increase that risk. Uh, operations offshore have the lowest risk. Pressurized containers. This is what's so important. When you design a scenario, you have to know what your source terms look like because pressurized scenarios are different than the uh, low pressure uh, containing scenarios. And the pressurized containers tend to have a higher failure rate and a higher risk. Uh, uncertainty hasn't been calculated. I, I know I need to do that. I know that that's, that's a major shortfall of what we've done. And I want to stress again, the consideration should be given to uh, the concepts of inherently safer technology. Simplification, keep the process simple. Uh, Isotanks don't do that. Moderate the reaction conditions. Low temperature, low pressure. Isotanks don't do that. Minimize the amount of material. Isotanks are kind of doing that on an individual basis, but you're still using the overall the same number. And substitution really doesn't apply here. Substituting uh, a, a lower uh, toxic material really isn't applicable here. So in summary, and I'll get off the stage, uh, low temperature, uh, low pressure processes generally have lower, lower the risk. Uh, the triad, um, which has several of these low temperature, low pressure operations, generates the lowest of the risks. Uh, rail transport, as it stands now, generates about a double the risk uh, from Ashdod. And scenarios with higher number of operations will generate higher risk. Um, and with that, I've discussed both of those. Um, I can certainly get off the table now.